so you can pop in for uh, a last session of the day. Um, it is. It is. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the theme of the day, uh, uh, outside of pathways to parenthood, is really thinking about legally securing your family. Um, you know, after uh, the road decision this year, um, you know, we're also sort of uh, shocked, um, surprised about how um, how we are being protected and the things that may uh, become upended, um, which we think shouldn't be able to be overturned so easily. Um, and and the reality is, is that a lot of our families, people are just reaching out to us saying, well, are our families next? Um, are our marriages next? Um, what do we have to think about as we start to create families? Um, you know, are there things that we didn't think about before? You know, or are there things that people have been doing all along that we just didn't and don't know about? Um, and so it was just uh, important uh, to make a space for that conversation. Um, and in that space making, uh, we stumbled across Hannah, um, who uh, we have quickly uh, come to find out, uh, you know, had been really integrated in so many of these spaces in relation to securing your family um, or securing yourself, quite frankly, right? Uh, as queer uh, identities, um, there are so many things we have to think about. Um, you know, whether you're a trans person and you're looking to uh, uh, sort of define and, and exist in the world in your in your right way, right? So changing your name, gender markers, um, whether you're a queer person and you're thinking, you know what, um, I am single and I don't have a family to think about in that same sort of context as, as we have with, with cis straight families. Well, prepare your will. What does that look like? Um, or maybe you decide to get married um, or find a partner and maybe what do you do there? So, you know, it's, it's been exciting to, to learn about what Hannah has been creating in our community, um, but I'm just excited to spend a little time to sit down and just uh, sit back um, and listen and hear um, uh, sort of what Hannah has been doing. So I will stop rambling right now and make a space uh, for you, Hannah, to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are and what brought you to uh, this, this space of focusing on LGBTQ identities in your legal practice. Sure. So my name is attorney Hannah Bakken Doty. I'm born and raised here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, born at St. Anne's, went to Christ the King, Tree of Life, Capital Undergrad, went in the Army. I went gay. Don't ask, don't tell. Went out of the Army, went to law school. Um, I have been um, an advocate for the LGBT community ever since I found out I was in the LGBT community. Um, and I found that out on accident by mistake uh, when I was about 15, 16, and my mother tried to get the demon of homosexuality out of me before she released me to the world, um, which ended up being my father's mother, who I call Nona because she abhors grandmother, it's all relevant. Um, anyway, she um, wrote a check to the National Treasury for my undergraduate education paid for by the Army and said, go to law school. And so I went to law school. And I was really my first introduction into just how catered to this white cis head um, community is by the laws that they paid to create. Um, I will tell you that before Obergefell was passed in 2015, which allowed marriage equality to extend to same sex couples, um, we were creating these protections. We were doing the work legally with paperwork to fumble together the thousands of rights that come with the, yes, I do, marriage, whatever. And then Mary Polly asked, Jim Obergefell, a Cincinnati resident, went all the way to the Supreme Court with some other lesbians who were looking for confirmation of their child. And they said, you have to recognize us. We're citizens. They said, sure, we do. Here we go. And um, Scalia was the one in that decision to make a real stink about blah, 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 whatever. Um, and then he, uh, Denzel just mentioned the Roe decision, which we all kind of call the Roe decision, it's the Dobbins decision that overturned Roe and um, basically canceled the right to safe and protected abortion. Um, and Thomas, who is my new Scalia, which is a fun dude, Justice Thomas and his wisdom and his dissent with, for whatever reason, because he also concurred with the opinion, but in his dissent, he said, we should look at gay marriage. Hey, by the way, fuck those guys. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, with the kids. Um, so everyone freaked out. And um, everyone's like, yeah, what is going to happen with gay marriage? And I'm like, well, let's look at what's happening with abortion. Okay. Let's think worst case scenario. I'm a risk averse kind of person. That's why I took this job. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Um, so what they're doing with abortion is okay. All these past abortions, they're fine. That was legal. It was legal at the time you did it. You're fine. Go ahead. But this date, no more legal abortion. So if they treat women and abortion the same way they're going to treat the gay community, then what I assume is that our marriages will be grandfathered in, that existed at the time, that were correct, 
and legal, and then the midday no more. So, and then it leaves a question, well, what about all these children? What about the marital presumption? What about equal protection under the law? You know what? That's a great question. You should get a power of attorney. You should get a nomination of guardian for minor children in case something happens to both of you guys in the Titanic and maybe grandma's not the best person to take care of your two by kids. <laughs> you know, just but like the thing is, these things have existed all the time for straight people because life awful happens to them, I hear. Um, but with our inability to biologically integrate our families to one another, except in some rare situations, um, you do need to legally fabricate the rights that are given to people upon being born in a family or being married. Um, and then obviously Jim Obergefell upon death, the right to be on your partner's um, death certificate, get their benefits. So <laughs> we've worked very hard and uh, did a very lot of, a lot of stuff to get to this point. I really do think Thomas is the new Scalia and just old man yells cloud kind of thing. Aberration, but you really can't trust anyone as far as you can throw them in these days, especially with the 50-50 legislature that can't overcome a super majority and a uh, veto, which we can talk about later. But right now, our Supreme Court is very much originalist, which says, what does the Constitution say? So we're going to take them at their word, and we're going to say, okay, you're going to follow this rule of law for now? Great, cool, love that journey for us. Um, we're going to go ahead and hold you to your word and write all this paperwork of the Ohio Revised Code and statutes that say you must respect it because we've taken the time to do it. Um, and that's now what's coming back, unfortunately, in this political age. People are realizing that marriage does not cover all things. And if you're adopting or if you're creating a family with a third party who's not genetically related to you, guess what? There's some legal ramifications that are going to happen. And maybe they never will. Maybe you're going to go to BFE and somewhere and just live nowhere off the grid. No one's ever going to bother you. But maybe you want to take a vacation to California and then all of a sudden your kid breaks his foot and your wife can't get in the room because she's not on the birth certificate. Whose fault is that? Not yours, the government. But we have to correct their mistake and cover our backs because we've had to our whole existence. So there is a framework. There is work that can be done. There are documents that can be shuffled together to protect the rights that you have based on whether or not they say so. Whether or not we should have to, let's ask Tammy Baldwin, who's trying to get a um, national amendment to our constitution that says gay marriage is legal. Gay marriage, gay people have these rights. So we have a lot of moving pieces and a lot of moving parts, but that's why it's so important to vote, especially in your elections now that are local, because all of this stuff matters. So you have estate planning, you have family planning, you have um, what we call emergency planning, which is kind of part of estate planning, your powers of attorney, what happens if you're permanently unconscious, you as a person can make the decision now, pull the plug, let me live forever, I believe in miracles. And you know what? My wife gets to say so, or my girlfriend gets to say so, not my mom who kicked me out at 17 for being a gay person, your honor. That's just it. And we just get to write that shit down because we get to pay for it. We get to pay to play and have the privilege. Now we're just covered in paperwork. It's going great. We're going to sleep at night. We're going to get it on. Thank you, sir. So. Yeah. Uh, thank you. No, you thank you. Thank you for all that. Thank you for all that. And there's so many things you like. It's like, where do you, where do you start to unpack? Like, like oh, so many things to unpack. Let me know. But, but the thing that, that sits with me is, um, you know, where, where do we start legally, right, in terms of paperwork mm -hmm. to protect ourselves, right? Even, even before the idea of, you know, bringing kids into the world, mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to do something for ourselves as, as, as yeah. individuals. Yeah. If, uh, I was going to say, if you were a fair person, as a fair person, <laughs> like, where would you start? Is it, is it, I mean, I would probably say is, it's a bill. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's how we start the middle. But I don't know. It's very much. Where do you where do you start? Well, start securing. Yeah, you start with search. You start with Google search. You start seeing okay, who's done this before? Because I'm not the only weirdo out there trying to live my life. And the truth is that the Secretary of State of Ohio has done a great job making standard forms available. Healthcare power of attorney, financial power of attorney, living will, which is different than your last will. It's just confusing. Mm -hmm. Your living will is your decision as an intelligent person now, if you are ever permanently unconscious and never going to wake up and two doctors make that determination or so sick that you're never going to recover and all your medical treatment has been exhausted and you're just being kept alive for funsies and say bye. If either one of those situations are the case, you as a person now say, healthcare power of attorney, if that's ever my situation and my doctor, my second doctor confirm I'm not coming back from this, take me off of artificial hydration and nutrition, basically your IV, allow me to die naturally. Don't take any extra, you know, extra pressure or take all the measures. I live a miracle. I don't live forever. It's both, right? 
And so essentially, it's an opportunity for you to say, healthcare power of attorney, here's what I want. I can't talk to you. And that's really the gift of that. But there are statutory forms that just require witnesses. They don't even need a notary that you can get now and that are effective upon signature. And, you know, you went to, I went to, so Dobbins happened. Some days and lesbians got scared. I got on Facebook. They said, come down to date. And I said, I'm coming to date. And I'm bringing all these freaking forms. They signed one NDA. I sit there and notarized all day, just all day. It was a bar. It was an axe throwing bar. This is how we're coming together. You know, Cindy's calling Sherry, calling Lynn, calling Tenny, who's calling me and saying, hey. And I'm like, sure, I have a word document. What are your kids' names? Let me get you sorted. And so the, the emergency planning is something that you can do now. The state has given you an opportunity to make those actions, and you should. Um, but then once you have children or once you have assets, um, you should reach out to an attorney to make sure those assets are properly titled, specifically not a will. A power of attorney that allows someone to put into their name or in the name of a trust if there's a disability or if there's kids, um, an asset. So that it doesn't go to probate to get said to the will to get to the person, it just gets transferred directly. They go to the BNB with the TOD for your vehicle and say, "Hi, they're dead. This is me. You're writing the title." And they go to the bank, the bank, and with the TOD for the Huntington account, say, "Hi, I'm me. This person's money is now should be transferred to my account." As opposed to your will that says everything to my spouse, and their spouse goes, "Hi, or I'm a spouse." They're like, "Okay, here's a forty thousand dollar bond. Come back in six months." We'll get you a piece of paper that says you can do these things. And then you're going to take those assets and put it into a trust account so that we can watch it. And then after you paid us our filing fee, the attorney waited six months, buried your lover and gone on with your life. Then we'll give you access to that money. You don't want to will. You want to plan. You want to work with your attorney for the freaking pieces of paper that are out there. I mean, Huntington had their little TOD online. You just print it off and sign it saying everything in my life. Or you can add your husband onto the account. Same with the car, same with the boat, same with the house. Anything that has a title, anything you can put your name on it, not your couch. You know, everything else. You can literally say, hey, an auditor of state, if I die, everything to my spouse. Or to my estate, to my trust, where I've written out all this stuff and says, to this charity, to my kids until they turn 25, and then they get a third of the trust, and then at 30, they get the second. And at 35, the trust closes. But until that time, this person's responsible for paying their bills and making sure they go to college, that they're an addict, making sure they don't have an I'm like, There are so many ways to make a plan. And if you don't have a plan, if you die, what we call intestate, uh, means without a will, your, your um, estate, your assets are distributed according to what the statute says, which is Families. Let's start with family. So that's going to go to your parents first, equally. If they're not alive, then to your brothers and sister, equally. If they're dead, it goes to their kids, equally, in the portion with which they would have had. <sighs> anyway, make a plan. Don't write a will. Don't pay for freaking legal Zoom. Don't pay for that. It's the bar associations have free clinics all the time. The the statutory language is written with the Secretary of State saying what the bottom. I mean, find an attorney if you're confused. But start with a Google search because there's so much information out there. And, and whatever you do, don't write it yourself. We call those holographic wills, which is a really stupid name because a holograph is cool, but it's not that. <laughs> Basically, it's like from our law class where the guy had a tractor fall on and he wrote in the dust what his will was. And it's like, is that all? Is he under duress? Like, we don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's emergency planning, which is, let's make sure our asses are covered if something were to happen to both of us, you know? or either of us, and then there's a state planning, which is after I'm gone, or if I'm ever incapacitated, which is happening more and more, this is what I want to happen with my life, or my kid, or my assets. And then you just go about living your life. You throw it in the back pocket, now that I have a digital copy that we've emailed to whoever, and just go live your life. But it does take the time to think and plan, because what's going to happen is if you don't, then your stuff will be done for you. And it's not, this system isn't made for us. Yes, in the back. So where do you, you would have property, but where does that kind of document get kept? Yeah. That is accessible when mm -hmm. people come mm -hmm. to your important forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of people have like, you know, important forms behind their refrigerator or in the freezer because it's the last thing to burn. That's my favorite one. <laughs> I'm like, why is this cold and a little like screamy? <laughs> uh, no, so what I typically do is I create a cloud, cloud based folder that is encrypted and I keep all your digital copies there so you can just scan an email it to your doctor. 
Because typically, if you go to the hospital, the first thing they do is find out if your primary care physician is and reach out to them for a history. Included in that report should be your healthcare power of attorney and your living will. Um, if you have a bank, get them a copy of your financial POA so they know who's on the account. Financial advisor. It just that the follow through at the end that makes it worthwhile because if you have a treasure map and don't actually follow it, then that's your problem. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta implement the plan. You gotta go and make sure your name is on the bank account. You gotta make sure rights of survivorship is actually written on your deed. You have to open the paperwork that makes you want to die and double check before you do die. Um, but yeah, what's the, once you have all these documents created, they need to be infiltrated into your system. They need to be created as part of your roots. And so the healthcare power attorney should know where it is. They should probably have an original copy, but you should keep your original thing, right? Um, most places don't require originals anymore, except for the um, probate court does require originally your will. Um, but, you know, I, I want all the documents that says a, a copy of this document will operate as the original. You don't need to feel the stamp to know that they took the time to do this. And I always put my information on there if anyone has a question or follow up. But yeah, you do need to actually then go ahead and create an bank account for your trust to have, you know, otherwise you're just making a lot of plans for nothing. A road trip you're never taking. Other questions before I go back to Denzel? Yeah. Steve. This one's you remember. Thank you. Steve. Yes. This one feels a little specific. So if it's weird, let me know. Get out. What about for have you heard of any sort of legal complications or issues like let's say life insurance or something or giving it to uh you know a parent who has HIV positive or something to that effect where there's complications or where they're reluctant to release estates or something like that oh yeah sure that's a problem to be honest with you. that's just an adult problem okay. life insurance is always reluctant okay. okay um but what you should do is say i'll have you connect with my lawyer and they'll discuss the finer points with you and you know we'll go from there and that usually gets them to shut up and put up and if you need a free consultation see you i got you um and my cell phone's on my heart i always tell people you're not bothering me i'm hanging out with my lab people on the back porch just chilling and Chris is my wife. It's like, we don't be telling people that. You're going to do all the time. Like, apparently. It'll be a cat emoji, so I know it's useless. Cool. Yeah, the life insurance is tricky because that's another way to sort of, um, well, it's it's one of the most common ways beyond real property to create and maintain wealth in, in families is to do lots of life insurance policies and to pass it along to your people. And all of a sudden, you're going there. Third generation down the line. How wonderful is that? That's my icon, Ina Garth would say. Um, but these agencies will find any loophole and have been very practiced in doing so. So, and if they're trying to pull a fast one on you because you're Joe Schmo or Steve D, just let them know that you're not alone and you can't take advantage of me because I'm part of the community that cares. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, in some of these spaces, in all of these spaces, I think as, as queer people, when we start our families, usually one of us or one person in that family or in that relationship is the primary parent. Sure. So how do they yeah. think about it contextually? contextually. Yeah. Um, what do we do? Like, how do we make sure that both of us are our parents in that case? Like, what, what would you say is the first step to say, okay, what, you know, is it, is it, a, is it a second parent adoption? Is it, what is that process? Yeah, so family making, family planning. We've talked today about a lot of different ways. The foster care system, fostering to adopt, the um, artificial insemination of a sperm not your own if you're lesbians or surrogacy and gestational carriers and egg donors if you're a gay man, and then just straight adoption, straight adoption, <laughs> direct adoption, <laughs> where there is no child foster care or you find a mother and you pay for her time and then she gives you, uh, gives you she uh, weighs her point right. Um, there are, depending on what you do, there are so many different ways to do it. So people are really concerned about birth certificates, right? Am I, am I on the birth certificate? I'm on the birth certificate. Oh, the birth certificate. Uh, the birth certificate is a piece of paper. It's a rebuttable document. It has no valid validity outside of the state that you're in. And frankly, it's one of the most contestable and recreatable things ever, unless you're apparently a trans person who wants to correct your gender. And like, anyway, it was correct upon the time of birth. So Connie from Cook County will send me the appeal space when she finds the time. <laughs> They're like, you want the case number? I'm like, yeah, I want to know why my client's rights are being denied. So I can come for a name change, but you won't correct the birth certificate because the name was correct on the birth certificate. But what is the name correct? So why are you changing that? 
I have no time to plan in Cook County, but here we are. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. The birth certificate is a record keeping document. It's just the way for the state to say this person exists. Probably we think this person has their name on it. Um, in the juvenile court, for anyone who's familiar, there are always families coming in and said this. He, he, my daddy, he, my baby daddy. And it's like, actually, genetically, that one is. And that's the one that owes child support. So that we create these relationships all the time. And we're like, oh, correct. And so what we do is we use the, the, the court system to correct birth certificates if they're incorrect, if they don't have both parents at the time or if a parent has changed their name since and they want to update the birth certificate to accurately reflect the gender and name of their parents. Um, there are a couple ways to do it. First is the juvenile court, like I said, baby daddy, child support, juvenile court deals with that. Probate court also does parentage. They do it in the form of adoption. They separated them and their wisdom. But they both have jurisdiction over the same thing, the birth certificate. And I have physically sat down with the administrative magistrate from probate court and the administrative magistrate from the juvenile court. And basically a magistrate is to a judge what a RN is to a doctor. The magistrate do all the work, the doctor sign off. You guys, it's, um, <laughs> regardless. I sat them down there and like, you're super cool, I really enjoy your time. Um, you, probate court, say if you're on the birth certificate, you're a parent. You say if you're on the birth certificate, that's a rebuttal presumption. So whatever it be, can we kind of over the line or overlap? I'm like, yeah, you sure can. Are you going to do it your way? Right. Okay. You go ahead. Nothing changed. So we have second parent determination in the juvenile court. And then we have step parent adoption. If you're adopting the child of your spouse or um, just regular who helps adoption. If you're adopting both your, both, both spouses are adopting a child new. So let's start with the juvenile court. Second parent determination is been around forever. Ever since the surrogacy laws, we call it, it's a 308 at SEC, whatever. Uh, it's all a lot of Latin and stupidity, but all of it says is that um, it is beneficial to us in society if we view marriages as a binding legal agreement. And if the children of that marriage are legally attached as well and cared for, they're in that community. So we call that the marital presumption, which is if a man and a woman are married, and the woman gives birth to a child during the marriage, it is the husband's child because all women are faithful. The marital presumption. It is a rebuttable presumption because if the kid looks up, comes out looking like Jimothy down the street, we can do DNA tests now and we understand that you know we can change that. Or if you are a infertile straight couple who is using a third party to help create a family, which has happened since time of memoriam, Mary and Joseph, anybody. Anyway. You go to the courts and say, um, we used a sperm donor. We got them on the internet or whatever. Uh, or we used our friend, but we went to cryobio and had them do donations there. There is a medical professional intermediary, is what we call it. Someone that cuts the tie between a one-night stand hookup and getting pregnant and the intentionality of what it took to get this sperm to this egg to create this life. And so what the straight people say is, Your Honor, I, as a straight man, consented to this man providing his sperm is part of our thing and consented to the marriage and the pregnancy. I will be financially and personally responsible for this child. And the courts say, yeah, you will. You consented to it. You paid for it. This is your wife. Um, it's not cock holding or whatever they call it in the legal term. Um, anyway, that anyway um, as long as you can demonstrate that the spouse consented, that there was a medical intermediary, you provide the name of the doctor, what's called a non spousal artificial insemination affidavit, which is a very long way of saying we use somebody else. And you say, I swear we had the baby by this guy and it's all good. They will actually give you what's called a walkthrough hearing, which you don't even have to go to court. They're like, oh, you know this? That's super cool. Thanks, Anna. Check. That decree is what gets you into the Constitution's originalism which is what we're fighting against in the Supreme Court. They're like, oh, you don't see gay marriage in the Constitution. You don't see abortion in the Constitution. You get the GTF up, you know? What we do see is the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution that says, if you are a state and you're making a judgment, we as other states out of respect and efficiency will respect that judgment, right? It's just easier than having to retry the whole thing in a new jurisdiction. So by having that second parent determination, which is a 250 filing fee and typically about $500 to me for the time and effort, you then get a decree signed by a judge saying you are the legal parent of this child. No one else is, period. So you can go to Disney. You can go to Canada. You just have your little fun time. You want to buy an RV, sis? You do you. All right. The other option 
is let's say a uh, gay couple and one of the men already has a child from his previous marriage um, to Cindy, who is lovely. Um, <laughs> but the new spouse wants to adopt the child. That spouse has to wait a year and be uh, legally married to that spouse for a year, the state of Ohio thinks it's their best interest uh, to wait. And then they have to file and wait an additional six months until they can adopt. And then the court will send out a social worker to make sure that the home is safe, that the kid is happy, and that this is what everybody wants. And we all go to court in about a year to six months, sit before a probate court judge who says, yes, you're a family kid, come up here and bang the gavel. Right? But, um, but you also see those things as um, um, fixes for people who didn't use medical intermediaries, for people who had their brother come over and you know, hang out in the bathroom for 20 minutes where he went to his b-ball game. Like, for those people who don't have the money, the intelligence, well, the, the access to resources, um, they have done it the way that they've done it since time immemorial. But if, let's say, these two women come up with a child that's been theirs in the marriage, the marital presumption doesn't exist because there was no third party acting as the medical intermediary. And the court can't prove that that other person consented, even in an affidavit after the fact. So you have to go through hundreds of dollars and so much time and invasive interviews. And you're kidding me. Like, you like this one? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, you get the degree. So it's better than nothing. And if you can't do either one or you don't have the time or your family is different or you have uh, three or four adults as a parenting relationship, that's where you start creating nominations to guardian. That's where you start creating trusts. That's where you start creating the integrated personal relationships that are defined by letters. LGBTQ, but also letters in the sense of the law. And you just need to wrap yourself in the protection of the law that exists and then share the information with others who are out in the cold. <laughs> this is a parenting plan. This is supposed to be a parent, parenting specific. But you bring gender into the call, and suddenly nobody knows what the F they're talking about, and every judge is confused. I'm sorry, is it he, he, who? <laughs> oh, it. I demand celebration, not acceptance. Definitely not tolerance, definitely not negation. You will understand and you will reckon with the fact that we are people who deserve respect and have gone through a whole hell of a lot more than Connie ever did to get to this point and are dealing with your bias, your back aspirin ways, your misgendering throughout this entire freaking hearing. And we're still going to take it. And we're still going to take it because we have to to get to the next point. So, I mean, as soon as you bring in anything besides, you know, something they can recognize as, oh, that's the guy. I'm over it. <laughs> so, and you know, that's uh, today, and you helped out answering my questions, you know, in some unanswered. No, <laughs> they still need to be at the garden. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, if you had a family, and, well, you do, but if, you know, if I was coming in and, and you know, there's a, uh, we have, we have our, our child, um, in the process, oh, actually, yeah, you know, my parent is an example, you know, use my family example, you know, we've gone in the process, uh, we're sitting here, um, and you know, we think to ourselves, well, now how do we prepare ourselves for the future? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you have said something to me that that, that I have never thought, thought of. I mean, although my daughter says, when we ask her, when you get upset, what do you do? She says, make a plan. Mm -hmm. It was the most fast. Six. Uh, not even six yet. Oh. Not even six yet. But she's been saying, when you get upset, what do you do? Make a plan. So sweet. And <laughs> she's not doing that. Anymore, so. <laughs> Uh, but you make a point. You sure do. And and I think when we think about um, you know again our family sitting down, we say, "Well, we're together. We're married. You, she's adopted." The plan includes not necessarily a will, but a trust. Well, I don't know. You call it something else other than a will. So uh, make a. You, there was something before. Okay. Our return. Our return. No, last <laughs> new testament. Our parents, and that's the question to me. It's like, okay, I, I've always been told, yeah. they will. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't mess up. No. Now that I have my family, no. what are the, yeah. what are the several, several things that you say today? Uh -huh. Here's what I would advise your family to do. Like, I have my sheet. Like, yeah. Yes. You would say, <laughs> what are the several things that you would say to the family? Before I would they say, to make sure are in place? Yeah. Um, I would say, okay. 
So typically, let me just break it down for you. So I worked on a flat fee basis. I think hourly rates are thievery. I think to charge someone uh, 250 an hour to open an email, to send them a, a document, you know, charge them for six minutes for an hour and a half of your time, bullshit. Anyway, um, so I usually get half a front, half when it's done. Typically for an estate plan for one person, it's $500. For an estate plan for two people, it's a thousand. But like if it's the reciprocal estate plan, that's just, that's just control find the place. So I just knock it down. Then. But um, the typical estate plan for an individual includes these. Your nomination of guardian for yourself. If something happens to me where I'm unable to act in my best interest, this is the person on long term after the healthcare power of attorney kind of goes away. That on long term will basically be your parent. Um, your last will and testament, which can also include a testamentary trust, or it could be a poor over will to catch your assets that don't get titled to the trust. Or if you don't need a trust, then just the last will and testament. That's your stuff when you die. Who gets it in what quantities and who gets paid of your creditors? Power of attorney for finances. I typically do a general durable financial power of attorney. It's general in the sense that it's basically copy and paste in the statute saying you can do anything, which is an emergency planning. If it was like Denzel, I want you to go buy me this car. Here you go. Buy me this car. It's one thing. This is a general power of attorney for everything. We don't know what they're going to use it for. It's durable because that power of attorney for a car I would give you. Um, if I got hit by what? a car, uh, trying to get to my car and I wasn't able to act. Um, and I wouldn't want you to go get me a car anymore. That would be a bad thing. But a durable power of attorney for emergency purposes outlasts what we call your incapacity. So if you're no longer able to speak to your agent, they can continue to speak for you as opposed to before where if you're the person standing on the of the person, if they're disabled, so are you. In this case, if something happens to you, they can act. And that's similar for the healthcare power of attorney. The healthcare power of attorney also um, gives them power to act in your disability. It also includes the same language. I write it in such a way that it includes the same language as in the living will about your last illness so that there's clarity regardless of whether they have that other document. So we have last will and testament, nomination of guardian, healthcare power of attorney, financial power of attorney, living will, which we talked about here already. And then we have um, after you die, there's a body and you can say now what happens to that body. Um, we call that a nomination of representative for disposition of bodily remains, which is a very long way of saying you can say, I'd like to be free. I'd like to be given to science. I'd like to be cremated. I don't care. I'm not going to be there. You know, have a party um, or just, you know, guessing. Uh, turn my ashes into uh, bundles of wildflowers and then throw said wildflower while someone plays wildflower by John Denver. Like, I'm making this up. <laughs> this woman's going to ruin a whole ecosystem for her own little fun. But whatever. Um, all those documents together is your estate plan. If you have kids, you want to do a nomination of guardian for minor children, saying if something happens to me and my spouse, it isn't their parent. Um, and then if you have kids, or a bunch of assets, you also want to consider a trust, which is a way of taking all of your assets and saying, upon my death, these things don't go to my spouse, they go to the trust, where my spouse and I are in charge until we die, and then upon our death, a person that we trust is the trustee for our minor children until they turn an age we think they deserve the money. In the state of Ohio, if you would die and test date without a will, or with a will and not a trust, your kids inherited 18. Here's your lump sum, buddy. Some parents think that might be a bad idea. Um, typically, I can say I do 25, 30, 35, it'll close, or 40, or whatever. But then you're specific in the trust and say, hey, trustee, use, use this money for their benefit, anything that you think is good for them. Um, but any money that's left over, we'll go to them. So trust can be more expensive. I typically start at 1500 for trusts that include the other big portions, but also... Um, and then the will, instead of being like to my staff, we'll say to my trust. And then we call those a pour of the will because it catches everything like a funnel and pours it into the trust, which is already set up and ready to receive it. But if you don't have anything, just say to my spouse and then my kids, probably. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, you just cover yourself. Um, but yeah, people will charge you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And there's no reason to do it, especially when a lot of these are statutory anyway. But if you want like a curated experience with an attorney, go get one. But like, understand these are word documents that have been passed down for generations and they're just updating them. You're not getting anything bespoke. So you certainly shouldn't be paying 5K for something that they can copy and paste and that a paralegal's doing. Yeah. <laughs>
I actually have a teacher that's a Paula legal from a couple of noodle. She's gonna make for it. But the cat's a little, so I'm stuck in a rock at least. Little size dog. Uh yeah, so those are trusts. Yeah. I feel like I'm trying to absorb all of it. How's it going? Oh, okay. I'm just wondering. So, you know, like, I'm just wondering. So, you know, we're, we're I'm, I hope it's okay that I ask about our specific situation, but yeah, I um, already did. Hypothetically, <laughs> um, you know, we're going to use sperm donor through the sperm bank. No worries there. I mean, they're robbing, but. <laughs> I just met Carly, but I like. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I want to, you know, make sure that my mom has no legal. I don't know, nothing. Yeah. So, what is the right. quickest way to ensure that, um, you know, I give birth, we have a child, whatever. Mm -hmm. How do I like whatever. quickest way to make sure? Yeah. No other family sure. members uh -huh. have right. Yeah. right, right, right. So you guys, you're married. Yes. Do your work now before the kid. That says everything to each other, not you, mom, not you. And then once the kid is here, do a nomination of guardian to your spouse and then do whomever after your spouse. And that would come into play if there's ever a custody issue where something were to happen to both of you where for whatever reason you were unable to care for your kid. Um, and then also in the probate court, because again, the probate court and the juvenile court share a lot of stuff. Um, for the probate court is guardianship, the juvenile court is custody. But again, it's both kind of simple words you're saying how to cover someone who's either a minor or incapacitated. But what you need to do is draft the nomination regarding your minor children and then um, just make sure that in your last will and testament, there's a disinheritance clause with a explicit revoking of any gift that she might have been able to receive should she contest the will. And then what we'll do is we'll do what you should do is what then. Was that called? Uh, what? Huh? What was that called again? The dis. Oh, the explicit disinheritance clause. Okay. Um, so what the disinheritance clause, well, there's, for gay people, I do wills a little differently. At the start, I say, these are the people in my will, and these are the people explicitly not in my will. And if these people try to contest my will to get what they would have gotten if I had died in test date, which we all remember is, without a will, um, then anything they would have gotten is struck. And then at the very end, it says, I specifically did this with the work and help of an attorney. I have done this with my own <clears throat> free will and to my best of my ability. And then a will in order to be legal is different than other documents. So other documents can be notarized, which is just a sworn statement. A will has to be witnessed by two people over the age of 18, not named in the will, um, that can attest that the person signing the will, which we call a testator, is intelligent enough to understand their family and estate. And if the will is ever contested, those two witnesses have to come back and be like, yeah, they really were. But what we do is we do what's called a self affirming affidavit. <laughs> I got you there. Um, the self affirming affidavit is a notary stamp at the end of the will that we sign um, that says these witnesses were also in their right mind. <laughs> <laughs> because it was sworn. And we do that because we have to, because the LGBT community is under it. By the individuals that would rather not see us rot, including but not limited to the people that are supposed to care about us the most. You know, I went to go throw my key at my mom at the house when I was getting kicked out. She was taking down my posters. I'm like, I'm like, just and I went and I kept going through my keychain and I kept going, where is it? She had taken it, it was gone. So after the exorcism didn't work. And before she dropped me off on my grandma's doorstep, who handed me my first glass of brown liquor and told me that it still hurts. And, <laughs> which, when you said Maker's Market earlier, I'm like, Maker's Market? <laughs> well, uh, but all that to say, the reason I am doing this, because I have been a rejected child. I've been rejected from the army, from my family. And I'm here today because not one more woman, not one more child, not one more gay boy just trying to live his best life and instead is thrown to addiction and turned out and is now HIV positive. You know, my younger brother. There's so much we have to do. 
There is so much we have to do. Dating changes, adoption, the second parent establishment, gender marker correction, estate planning and trust, prenuptial, non-traditional relationships agreement, surrogacy, donor contract. Why? All we want to do is love and create and exist with the freedom to allow others to do the same. And as an individual who is living my truth with a wife who loves and supports me and now a very annoying 12 year old son who <laughs> just wants to shop. <laughs> I'm trying very diligently to be available as a resource to others who are even further down the line than I was. To turn around in that ladder and extend a hand to the transgender woman of color who can't even get her medicine, let alone her home. You know, I landed in my Nona's arms. Some people don't. And if there's anything that we can do as communities to sustain ourselves and protect ourselves and make ourselves more stable and secure so others can lean on us, that is our duty. To make yourself as strong as you freaking can be because the world's going to test it. And if you plan on bringing kids into this world, let alone kids that have already been rejected by others, you better be strong. You have to be strong because weakness will be exploited at every opportunity, which is why this situation is so important. The fact that this is free is so important. The fact that it's on a weekend, the fact that it's being stimulated and put on the internet, the fact that you guys are going to have your questions answered with people that give a damn. This is unique. Why? I think that is uh, the best ending to what has been a truly phenomenal journey. Um, you know, the reason why I think we continue to do this uh, is to make space uh, for people to share their stories, um, but also for people uh, who are looking to become parents, to start their families, to step into this space and have the resources that they should have to create the love of families that they want to. So I thank you all so much for spending time with us today, uh, for being vulnerable and sharing, um, for being motivated uh, to believe that we have the right to create our families uh, the way that we want to. Um, and we know that we've got to do a lot of legal work to make sure that we have the same privileges and rights and protections as some other our community members. So I thank you all again so much. It's been wonderful spending time with you today. Um, I know a lot of our resources and speakers will be around, if not later like here today, but also available online to connect and reach out to. Uh, so definitely do that. Um, and I will say, uh, welcome to our family. Yeah. Uh, so thank you all so much. <laughs>